R&R is part of measurement systems analysis. And we have measurement systems to decide whether or not to adjust any settings on our line or OK or scrap a product. And if we keep that in mind, we get a much clearer picture of what we should expect from R&R and how we should set it up when to use it. Hello, I'm Tom. Welcome to my channel where we talk about continuous improvement in an industrial setting. In this video, it's about R&R, but then specifically about why do we do R&R and what does that mean for when to implement it, how to check it, what to do with the results. Because quite honestly, I've made and I've seen uh, a lot of material on how to do an R&R, what the formulas are, but it's also good to, from time to time, think again about you know, why do we do it, what is the goal of checking the repeatability, reproducibility, and when we know that goal, it'll be a lot easier to then also make the correct conclusions about the data we get from it and what to do with it further in our improvement journey. So when we think about r, &R right, so repeatability, reproducibility, this is part of measurement systems analysis. So in the end, all of the measurement systems that we have, we get data, information from our processes, and we use that to decide whether or not you know, to, to change things on the line, to increase or decrease settings, to uh, make some changes to our production process. Or we also quite often will use measurement systems really to check. Huh? Is this product too heavy to go through, maybe too light to go through? So basically, do we have a good product or a bad product? In that, hopefully, so it's um, some of our measurements will really be okay, not okay. Quite a lot of quality measures are like that, but also, and that's why I said, hopefully many of our measurements are actually on a continuous scale. So weight, for instance, is on a continuous scale. And we say anything above one kilo is okay. Anything under is not okay. Or it has to be between these and these millimeters of length. That type of continuous measurement is much easier for r, r If you have the other type with the good, not good type of measurement, kappa analysis is the, let's say, the partner, the friend of r, &R. It's another part of measurement systems analysis that you use for such things. But both of them, and actually the whole measurement systems analysis, you use to check, is my measurement system good enough to make these decisions? So it's not about having the best measurement system you can have. It is about having a practical system, although r, &R will not really judge that, but it's practical, cost-effective way that is good enough to make a correct decision or at least give the correct information about whether or not we should change machine parameters or make a decision about the product itself. Now, what we then usually see in our processes is that when we have a measure, and here again, I'm talking mainly about those continuous measures like weight and length and humidity and, and things like that, that are on a scale. We have specifications, in this case, both an upper and a lower specification, but the product itself that comes from our line tends to come out, behave in a normal way, it tends to follow a normal distribution. So most of the products that come out center around the mean value and then there are a couple of say heavier, a couple lighter products and we have this normal distribution. What we are trying to do is generally to center this distribution. Most companies would like to see the, the mean value but also the whole distribution of what comes out of the line to be nicely in the center between those two specification limits. But the most important thing is of course that we do not cross the specification limit. Now, when we have this information about the process and we know that our goal with the measurement system is to make these information-based decisions on act or not, what we of course want to know is how precisely can we measure what is happening in practice. And for that, there are a couple of rules of thumb. The one that is traditionally used within R&R is that 
The RNR index should be preferably lower than 10%, that's world class, or up to 20, 30%, that's sort of the max. Now, what does that mean? It, it means that when we see this coming out of the line, we know that there is also some added variation because our measurement system also has variation in it. So actually, when this is the true product coming out, we have a broader um, spread that we see. And is this broader spread, is that more or less than 10% of what we fully observe? So in the total variance that we see, that we measure, is the measurement system itself causing less than 10%? Something that is quite similar to this, and also uh, definitely used in measurement systems analyses, is to look at it in a slightly different way that um, statistically, well, based on the formulas, it's, it's really different, but the goal of it is almost the same. We divide up our scale into 10 Okay, a bit more equal than I drew, but into 10 parts. And we say, can our measurement system correctly split, identify between when this whole distribution moves in 10% of our specification range? So can our measurement system get that one out from that one. Can it distinguish? Because here we see a shift occurring. Now, this shift, this is not the same as for statistical process control where we immediately say, you know, something has shifted, let's react. Here we are just looking at, can the measurement system give us this answer? And as I said, the formulas are a little bit different than can, uh, what, what part of variation is the measurement system adding, but the idea is the same. This is what we're trying to do. So we are trying to see if our measurement system can pinpoint, really pinpoint where the mean is, or that we are so much increasing the observed variation that you're basically only seeing three or so differences. So that means if this is less than 10 and a 30% uh, R&R score means that you only have basically three areas that you can truly distinguish. And so if you are above 30, it, it becomes even worse. But if you have 10 or 30, it means that when your distribution is moving a bit, your measurement system can pick up on it. If you have, have this less than 30, you need a very big shift. And in fact, you might already be measuring stuff on or over the specification limit, even though the, the true process mean is still nicely within. So the mean is definitely still within, but even the, the true distribution is still within. When that happens, so when we need a very large shift compared to our specifications to happen before the measurement system can, can truly identify, split between those things happening in the factory, then this measurement system will be very slow to give us the needed data. If you keep measuring and measuring, almost each system will at some point tell you that things are wrong. But we look at specifically what we are measuring right now and what we're using to act, right? So if we take five samples into a sample subgroup, that is one measurement. How much can that tell us? The other thing that you are getting from this is, aha, uh -huh, we are not looking at can, for instance, my scales distinguish on a gram? No, we are looking at can it distinguish something relative to the specification limits? So if we have a product that should be a kilogram, so 1000 grams, plus or minus 50, that means that from 950 to 1050, we have 100 grams of range in our specifications. In this case, 
if our scales are accurate enough to really accurately measure at least to 10 grams, we are fine, right? So maybe in this case you do still want to have the 5 gram possibility, but the whole system, because you know your whole measuring system is always slightly less accurate than specifically the measurement device. But anyway, getting into too much detail, the 10 grams is then a very good measurement system for that process. But if we have a kilo pro uh, product and it can be plus or minus 5 grams, so from 995 till 1005 grams, then of course we need a measurement system that can measure up to 1 gram specifically to reach that world-class level. So that's a, a very good thing about, you know, it is relative to how broad my specification is. The other way that we look at it, by the way, is to check the distribution itself. So we take the occurring distribution, the observed variation from our process. If you want to do this, then you do need to you know, collect quite a, a bit of samples and especially you need to collect samples randomly throughout your production. And then what you do is you say, okay, th this is what my machine is producing. Can my measurement system identify up to one-tenth of my produced variation? Generally, this is a bit tight and norm because hopefully your distribution will be a bit smaller than the specifications. And this links to CPK, so your um, production capability is one if this distribution is exactly the same as your specification limits. We generally strive to have you know, 1.3, 1.6, that range, although one is also quite common, but below one, we have a bit of a problem with our capability of the process anyway. So <clears throat> generally you see that checking it with the distribution itself is a bit tighter. And that is good to know because in the uh, Excel template that you can download, you know, uh, just use the links provided and download it from my website, you will get both. So if you enter your data there, you will get two R&R numbers. One is comparing it to the specification. One is comparing it to the observed variation. When you use the ANOVA method, you will always be comparing it to what you have observed. So keep that in mind. And there is also a link here with the CPK, because as I said, a CPK of one, that is when your distribution is equal to, and then the distribution here, we do take plus and minus three standard deviations, but it's equal to the specification limits. When it is, the CPK is higher, so here the CPK is 1.3-ish, you also see that when you use the ANOVA method and you have a relatively okay CPK, at least higher than one, you can let the 10% go a little bit. Right? So when you have a CPK of two, that's the, the easiest to do, right? that it fits twice, and actually it is correctly centered and fits twice in our specification limits, and that means that you can easily get away with a 20% R&R &R on the ANOVA, so on the distribution itself, because you still then have your 10% of the specification range. So a higher CPK means that, well, you can relax a little bit with how uh, completely precise our measurement system has to be. I will say that this, uh, I would, advice for the production measurements. So the measurement that you do as a, a very specific quality check uh, that you probably do less frequently, but you do in laboratory circumstances just to keep your good technological feel. You would like them to be a bit more precise in general, but <clears throat> when you have a higher CPK, so when the distribution is smaller compared to the specification in production, you can get away with slightly less accurate measurement systems because you still have plenty of room within the specifications. Another way to think about this is when you have a very high CPK, you also have a bit more bandwidth for your process to shift before you're going to hit one of the specification limits. 
So again, very accurate measurement is slightly less important. And that, and that brings us to sort of a strange uh, catch-22. It's, it's, the thing is, in processes where we have a low CPK, quite often the measurement system is also not ideal. Ah, so you have a, a double whammy there. If you have a process that is difficult to steer and difficult to measure, you've got a serious challenge. And quite often processes that have a very small uh, variation and therefore a nice and high CPK, generally they also tend to have quite a good measurability and that sort of automatically leads to a high R&R score, low in percentages, so, but a good R&R score, but you don't need it as much. Anyway, a lot of detail in there. To rehash, we do the R&R as part of measurement systems analysis and our measurement system should be good enough to make decisions about the process or the product. We generally consider a measurement system very good when it can distinguish between one-tenth of the range of our specifications or one-tenth to maybe a little bit more, a fifth or so of the observed variation coming out of the process. When we have not 10%, but 30%, that really is the max, right? If, it, if more than 30% of the observed variation comes from the measurement system, then it actually almost never is a good quality measurement system for this purpose. And like this, we know what to expect from our R&R study, when to really use it, because if we know we have a very high CPK, R&R is less important to do. Also, when we are already completely sure that our measurement system is not good, it's generally not very useful to do an R&R. It will just give you the answer you already knew. So first, make sure you improve the process. And then when you know that you have basically a stable process, but you have some doubts about the measurement system, go for R&R and see if it can get close to that 10% of the specification range. Now, if this helped you understand a bit what the goal of R&R is, don't forget to hit that like button. Send me a comment if you have any questions left, because I'll be happy to explain those as well. For now, I wish you the best of luck with your measurement systems analysis. And as always, don't forget to enjoy the continuous improvement journey.